Father, we are always grateful to gather together, Lord, in your name tonight, Lord. Thank you for who you are. Lord, we all need you. Every single one of us is in a battle, Lord God. We are facing, uh, Lord, the three enemies that we all face, Lord God, Satan, his demonic forces, Lord. We face the ungodly world around us, and, and we even battle against our own fallen sinful nature. Every one of us, Lord God, we, we, we face struggles. And so, Lord, I'm so grateful for Wednesday nights as we're able to come midweek, Lord God, and hear from our God, desiring, Lord, to be spoken to through your word, by your spirit, Lord. And so meet with us tonight, Lord. I pray that every single one of us has come, Lord God, specifically to hear from our God, that we would understand what you have for us and so that we would be able to practice it in our life. And so be with us, bless our time as always. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good evening, good evening. If you have a Bible, which I hope you do, Ezekiel 17 tonight, okay? Ezekiel chapter 17 tonight. There are 24 verses, and so if you're taking notes, you can write down Ezekiel 17, 1 through 24 is our passage this evening. Ezekiel 17, 1 through 24. Now again, real quick recap, and I try to make this as short as possible. Remember the setting of the book, okay? Ezekiel is a Man who is originally supposed to be a priest, but he's hauled into captivity by the Babylonians and he finds himself living in Babylon. It was there that God raised him up to be a prophet, to speak to his people. Because again, the children of Israel, again, were were far from God. God had used Isaiah, God had used Jeremiah, God had used, again, prophet after prophet to call the people out of their sin and back to God. But the people, again, they were so immersed, they were so wrapped up in their sinful lives that they ignored the words of the prophets. And instead, they turned to false prophets. They turned to people, other men, who would tell them what they wanted to believe. And so the Lord had to raise up again. Uh, He had Jeremiah preaching in Jerusalem, and he had to raise up Ezekiel in Babylon, again, to give the people his truth, to steer them away from the lies that they were listening to. Now, thus far, if you've been with us, Ezekiel has been giving message after message, and a lot of his messages were acted out. Okay, He was giving almost like skits before the people trying to get their attention. And what's so interesting as we began last week, again, we would say a new section, is that after acting out messages, sermons, warning the people to repent, to turn from their sin before, again, they would experience God's judgment, the people still weren't listening. A year had passed by. Okay, over these first 11, 12 chapters, and the people were still deaf to hearing God's word. They had hard hearts. They had closed ears. They were blind spiritually. And so what did God do? Well, very interesting. Last week, God began to speak to Ezekiel, calling upon him to get the people's attention in a different way. And what he began to do last week, if you were with us, is speak to the people in parables. Now, if you know your New Testament, you know that that's how Jesus often spoke, in parables, okay? Now, this is important because parables are lessons of comparison. In other words, you are using something that people understand in everyday life, and you teach a lesson through these everyday things to Teach the people what you want them to understand. And God would use Ezekiel to do this because they weren't listening anyways. And so God, in his love and mercy, I thank the Lord that God could have so easily given up on them, but God chases after us. Isn't God good? He chases after us, right? Even though we're hard-headed, even though we hear sermon after sermon and still don't listen because of the love of God, he chases after us. And so he commands Ezekiel, well, try something different. Speak to them in a different way. Now, one of the biggest problems, this is what you have to remember tonight, is the people were rejecting the words of Jeremiah. They were rejecting the words of Ezekiel. And as I mentioned, they were listening instead wanting to believe in the false messages of the false prophets. Now, what were the false prophets saying? They were saying three important things that you need to keep in the back of your head. Number one, they were telling the people, you don't have to repent, you don't have to turn from your sin because, number one, 
God would never judge his people. Israel is the wife of God who entered into a covenant with God at Mount Sinai. God would never judge his own wife. Number two, they told them, you don't have to repent. You don't have to worry. God would never judge his city. Jerusalem, I mean, it's the city of God, God's house. The temple was there. And so they believed again. They could continue in sin because you know what? God would never judge the city of Jerusalem. And number three, they told them, don't worry. God would never judge his people because God made a promise to King David way back in 2 Samuel, okay? Promising David that there would always be one from his offspring, one from his line who would always reign upon the throne of Israel. And so the false prophets, knowing that promise, knowing God would never break his promise, basically told the people, don't worry, God's not gonna judge us, he's not gonna judge our king because, again, God made a promise to King David. Now for these reasons, beginning last week, Ezekiel began giving parables in response to these three misconceptions. If you were with us again last week, we began the three parables of judgment. Tonight is part two. And we began looking at parables proving, proving that the judgment of God is certain because God said so. And he was already using Jeremiah and Ezekiel to declare that. Now, if you were with us last week, again, we covered two parables. And if you missed it, go back and listen to it. Number one, the useless vine. Israel was, was a vine, right? God is the vine dresser. And God had planted and blessed Israel so that they would bear fruit. But remember, they refused to bear fruit because they were selfish. They didn't want to serve the Lord. They wanted to serve themselves. And so they made themselves useless to God. What do you do with useless dead wood? You cast it into the fire. And that was one of the lessons that we learned from our text last week. We then came to the second parable. The second parable I called the faithless wife or unfaithful wife. Here the people were chasing after false gods chasing after these false religions, being wrapped up in the sinful lives just like their ungodly neighbors. Here they were supposedly married to God. They should have been loyal to God. They should have been faithful to their God, but instead they worshiped other gods and they made themselves an unfaithful wife. Now tonight we come to parable number three and we find this in chapter 17. If you're taking notes, the parable is known as the two eagles and the vine. You can write that down. It's really important. The two eagles and the vine. The first thing we're going to look at, again, for you note takers, is the riddle, okay? Is the riddle that God gives Ezekiel to give the people. Let me ask you real quick. Anyone like riddles? Because this is going to be a good one, okay? This is going to be a good one. Let's begin here. Chapter 17, verse 1. The word of the Lord came to me. This is Ezekiel speaking. Son of man, propound a riddle and speak a parable to the house of Israel. Now again, we pick up right where we left off. Ezekiel has finished giving the people two parables. And once again, God speaks to him, commanding him to pose a riddle to the people of Israel. Speak to them in a parable. Now again, I think this is always important and I encourage you when you study God's word, when you have a question, stop and ask. Stop and figure out the question. And the question you should be asking yourself is what is the difference between a riddle and a parable? You guys with me? Very important, let me explain this. This is gonna help kind of give some insight. A riddle, if you're taking notes, is a statement that hides the truth it imparts. A riddle is a statement that hides the truth it imparts. A parable explains the truth by showing it in a fresh light through the use of comparison, okay? Very, very important. That's the difference. Let me say it another way. This might even be easier. A riddle conceals the truth. A parable reveals the truth. 
Real simple, very important. Again, I love this. A riddle conceals the truth. A parable reveals the truth. Now, what I love about this, you have to understand what God is doing, what God is commanding. He wants Ezekiel to declare a message to them. Give them a story, okay? But in the story, it needs to be a riddle and that it hides a deeper meaning. But at the same time, it needs to be a parable that uses things that they can understand for comparison's sake. And so I love this. This story that we're about to read has a surface meaning and a deeper meaning. And it's so incredible as we take the time to break this down to see the story that God gave Ezekiel to declare to the people. Now remember, why is God doing this? Well, real simple. God wants to reach his people. Again, they had made themselves hard of hearing. And one of the interesting things about the Israelites is they loved riddles. And there are many examples, not only in the Psalms, but also, how many of you remember the story of Samson? Do you remember that story? When Samson posed a a riddle, you guys remember that? These were people who loved riddles. And I love the, the brilliance of God. He commands Ezekiel, speak to them in a riddle. That will get their attention, maybe, Maybe then they'll listen and understand what I'm saying to them. And so verse three, say, thus says the Lord God, you gotta really pay attention here. A great eagle with great wings and long pinions, feathers, rich in plumage of many colors, came to Lebanon and took the top of the cedar. He broke off the topmost of its young twigs and carried it to a land of trade and set it in a city of merchants. This is a riddle, pay attention. Then he took of the seed of the land and planted it in fertile soil. He placed it beside abundant waters. He set it like a willow twig and it sprouted and became a low spreading vine. And its branches turned toward him, toward the eagle, and its roots remained where it stood. So it became a vine and produced branches and put out bows. And so we are given the riddle. And I love this, right? I almost wanna give us a test and say, does anyone know what it means yet, right? Because this is the idea. Ezekiel's there, he's declaring this to the people. Do they understand? Would they catch the riddle, what this is about? Now again, in a quick recap, the parable describes a giant eagle with long feathers of many colors that came to Lebanon and took the highest branch from a cedar tree. The eagle then carried that branch off to a land of trade. That's what it says. The eagle then took some seed from the land of the cedar tree and planted it in a fertile field beside abundant water so that the vine had every opportunity to grow, which it did, sprouting up and spreading forth its branches becoming a low spreading vine that turned toward the eagle. Very simple, again, very simple story, but again, with with deep meaning. Let's see if we, we can comprehend what is happening. Verse seven. And there was another great eagle with great wings and much plumage. And behold, this vine bent its roots toward him and shot forth its branches toward him from the bed where it was planted, that he, the second eagle, might water it. It had been planted on good soil by abundant waters, that it might produce branches and bear fruit and become a noble vine. Now again, if you can imagine the story, you have that vine that had grown, a low spreading vine, that already had its 
branches toward the first eagle that had planted it, that had made sure it was, had enough water to grow. When all of a sudden, a second eagle shows up. The second eagle was similar to the first, although you might have noticed, it did not have long pinions. Anyone catch that? It did not have <coughs> the long feathers so that it was like the first eagle, but it was not as glorious. Now, when this second eagle appeared, the branches that were toward the first eagle all of a sudden moved toward the second eagle. You guys with me? Very important. Now the question is, why? What is this about? Why was this low spreading vine that was planted by the first eagle, that was given every opportunity to grow and to blossom, all of a sudden, at one point it was directed toward the first eagle, but it decided when the second eagle showed up to spread its branches toward that second eagle. And that's the question. This is a story, again, it's a riddle, and the question is, what does this mean? Now we should be asking, again, as you consider the story, what would make the vine do that? What would make the vine turn away from the one that planted it, from the one that provided every opportunity for it to grow? Why would it turn away from that first eagle and turn to the other eagle that had done nothing for it? Does that make sense? Why would it do that? And this is the moral to the riddle. Why would the branch do that? Notice, the vine turned toward the second eagle that he might water it. Now, if the first eagle had already provided enough abundant water for it to grow, why was it not satisfied? Why did it instead turn itself toward the other eagle? And this is the key to the riddle. Now, verse 9. God tells Ezekiel, say, thus to the Lord God. Will it thrive? Will the vine thrive? Will it continue to grow? Will he, will not the first eagle pull up its roots and cut off its fruit so that it withers, so that all its fresh sprouting leaves wither? It will not take a strong arm or many people to pull it from its roots. Behold, it is planted. Will it thrive? Will it not utterly wither when the east wind strikes it? Wither away on the bed where it sprouted. God's asking the question. After what this vine did, disrespectfully we would say, with, with ingratitude toward the first eagle that planted it, God says, what do you think's gonna happen? Do you think that vine is gonna to continue to grow? You think that vine is going to continue to blossom or do you think that eagle is gonna be so upset after all that it had done for that vine that it rips it out of the ground, that it uproots it out of the ground and leaves it there to die? And this is God's, God's question. What would you do if that was you? What would you do if after all that you had done for somebody, they turn their back on you? They disrespect you. They have no gratitude for all that you had done for them. And this is, this is the question. This is the riddle. Did they understand the riddle? Did they understand what the message was about? Let me ask you, do you know what this is? is all about. Do you know the message that God was trying to give them? And you have to imagine Ezekiel declaring this riddle in the, in the, in the ears of the people, wondering if they would understand, wondering if they would be able to discern what this riddle was all about. Let's move on. Second thing. After the riddle, how about the, the explanation? 
How about the explanation? Because remember, God wants to make sure that they understand his word. Verse 11. Then, the word of the Lord came to me, Say now to the rebellious house, do you not know what these things mean? Tell them, behold, the king of Babylon came to Jerusalem and took her king and her princes and brought them to him to Babylon. Now here we have Ezekiel by the word of the Lord revealing what the riddle is all about. And he begins to to provide some clarity. Who was this first great eagle? He tells us the king of Babylon. Who's the king of Babylon? You guys remember his name? Nebuchadnezzar. Okay? Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon. And so the eagle, if you're taking notes, the great eagle is Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. He says that Nebuchadnezzar came to Jerusalem. Now, if you remember the story, look back a couple verses, it said the eagle went to Lebanon. Take a look, look, look at your verse. Why would it say that? Well, some of you might remember when we covered the books of the kings that all of the wood used to build the house of God, Solomon's temple, came from where? from Lebanon, okay? It came from Lebanon. We find this, I'll show you quickly. In 1 Kings chapter 7, verse 2, he, Solomon, built the palace of the forest of Lebanon, a hundred cubits long, 50 wide and 30 high, with four rows of cedar columns supporting trimmed cedar beams. Therefore, when it says that the king of Babylon came to Lebanon, It's referring to him coming to the house of the Lord, coming to the king's palace, both of which were built by cedar trees, and doing what? And took her king and princes and brought them to him in Babylon. Now again, in our riddle, you can look back. That great eagle comes, and he takes the top branch from the cedar tree, and he carries it off to the land of trade. Isn't that right? That's Babylon. We find this, if you're interested, back uh, last week in chapter 16, verse 29, Babylon was the land of trade. And so the riddle refers to Nebuchadnezzar coming to Jerusalem, taking the top branch, the highest person, right? The king of Judah, from Jerusalem and hauling him back to Babylon in captivity. And again, if you know your history, we've covered this many times, this is exactly what happened. 2 Kings 24, 15, and he, Nebuchadnezzar, carried away Jehoiachin to Babylon. The king's mother, the king's wives, his officials, and the chief men of the land he took into captivity from Jerusalem to Babylon. And again, this is exactly what we read. Look back at verse 12 at the end. Um, The king of Babylon came to Jerusalem, took her king and her princess, and brought them to him to Babylon. And so we're beginning to understand what this riddle is all about, but keep reading. Verse 13, and he took one of the royal offspring and made a covenant with him, putting him under oath, the chief men of the land he had taken away, we just read that, that the kingdom might be humble and not lift itself up and keep his covenant that it might stand. Now, if you remember the story, when Nebuchadnezzar removed Jehoiachin, Josiah's son, one of his sons, who was the rightful king of Judah, When he removed him and his family and hauled him into captivity, he installed a puppet king on the throne. His name was Zedekiah. He actually named him Zedekiah. Who was Zedekiah? Well, he was King Josiah's youngest son, who was Jehoiachin's uncle. 
He was a part of the royal family. And that's why, again, we read in verse 13, he took one of the royal offspring and made a covenant with him. What Nebuchadnezzar did is that he made Zedekiah swear by his God, swear in the name of the Lord, make an oath, a vow before God that he would remain faithful to Nebuchadnezzar, that he would remain a loyal servant to Nebuchadnezzar. And that's exactly what he did. He made a promise, an oath, a covenant that he would be a loyal subject unto Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was the one that was really in charge. In other words, King Zedekiah, although he was now king, he was under the rule of Nebuchadnezzar. And that's why, look back at what it says, verse 14, that the kingdom might be humble, because he was under authority, and not lift itself up, not be prideful, and keep his covenant that it might stand. Now the reason this is important is because, what did our riddle say? The riddle said that the eagle (laughs) took some of the soil from the land of the cedar trees, Israel, and planted it in Jerusalem where it would grow, right? He installed himself a puppet king. And the interesting thing is so long as Zedekiah remained loyal or faithful to serve King Nebuchadnezzar, the kingdom of Judah prospered. The kingdom of Judah was able to function and grow, which if you remember your history, went on for 11 years, okay? It went on for 11 years until something happened. Well, verse 15. But he, King Zedekiah, rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar by sending his ambassadors to Egypt that they might give him horses and a large army. What happened? Well, after 11 years, Zedekiah became prideful. He started thinking to himself as he was prospering, as the people in the city were prospering, why am I having to serve this guy? And he forgot the promise he made in the name of his God. He forgot the covenant of loyalty that he made. And so what did he do? He sent ambassadors to Egypt, to Pharaoh, who was the second eagle. And he made a promise to the Egyptians that if they would send their army to help them overthrow their Babylonian rulers, then they would serve the Egyptians. And that's exactly the story. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar installed Zedekiah, right, in his office, in his position. He was the the seed that grew into a low-spreading, humble vine. And for 11 years, its branches were toward the first eagle until it decided, you know what? I don't want to serve that anymore, that eagle. And it began to turn its branches toward the second eagle again, which was Egypt. Now we read this again in 2 Chronicles 36, 13. He, speaking of Zedekiah, also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who had made him take an oath in God's name. He became stick-necked and hardened his heart and would not turn to the Lord, the God of Israel. He became so prideful that he wanted to do what he wanted to do. And in the midst of this, if you remember from the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah was telling him, don't do that. Don't look to Egypt. How many of you remember that over and over in God's word, Egypt always symbolizes this ungodly world? And we are never to go back to Egypt, right? We are supposed to leave Egypt behind like the Israelites did. But sadly, they continue to want to go back to Egypt to rescue them, to deliver them. And Jeremiah, if you remember again, in the midst of when this was happening, was warning the king, don't do it because when push comes to shove, the Egyptians are not going to be able to deliver you. 
Now what's important again is to understand that all of the verses that I showed you at this point as Ezekiel was declaring the riddle, they had already taken place. Which means that the people should have understood. They, they saw this, they witnessed all of this happen before their eyes. And so they should have understood the story. They should have put two and two together and understood what the riddle meant. But why did they not? And the simple answer is that they were listening to the false prophets. They did not believe that what Jeremiah was saying was right. They did not believe that what Ezekiel had been warning them about was right. And instead, they focused on the false prophets who told them again, you don't have to turn from your sin. You don't have to turn back to God because God is not going to judge you anyways. And so the Lord then asked them if they understood the riddle. Look at verse, or keep reading the verse. Will he, who's he speaking about? Will the vine, will King Zedekiah thrive? After what he's done, after betraying Nebuchadnezzar, will he thrive? Can one escape who does such things? Can he break the covenant and yet escape? Now, these are rhetorical questions because what's the answer? No. Is he gonna get away with this? Is Nebuchadnezzar going to allow this to happen? After all Nebuchadnezzar had done, installing him, giving him rule of the kingdom, allowing Judah to prosper only for him to break his covenant that he made before his own God, turn his back on Nebuchadnezzar and turn to their sworn enemy. Is God going to allow this to happen, right? Is, is Nebuchadnezzar going to allow this to happen? Is he, or is he going to have to pay the consequences for his foolishness? And this is the meaning of the parable. I want you to think about the simple fact that when God has been so good to us, and has God been good to us? When we consider the goodness of God, the blessing of God, where we were or where we would be today without God, and we recognize all that he's done for us, to turn our back on him, to betray him, to be unfaithful or disloyal to him, do we think we're gonna get away with that? Do we think that's okay to do that to God? Because remember, that's exactly what they had done, right? They didn't believe that. They didn't see that with their own eyes, but that was the reality. They had backstabbed their own father. Now, this is powerful because this is something, again, thousands of years ago from the Old Testament that we have to consider for ourselves. Are we ungrateful, spoiled brats? Are we? I mean, it's a personal thing, right? But are we ungrateful, spoiled brats who have been unfaithful, who with ungratefulness in our hearts have turned away from God after all that God has done for us? Because that's what they had done. And it's so sad, again, you know, as we apply this to our lives today, when we put our faith in Christ Jesus, We go to God in prayer, don't we? Personally, not to a man, not to a church. We go directly to God. And we acknowledge our sinfulness. We cry out to God asking for forgiveness. The Bible says that we're to turn away from our sin and turn to God, right? And we ask God, just like they did in the Old Testament at Mount Sinai, we will be your people and you will be our God, right? That's what they did. And we're to do that same thing. Lord, I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Forgive me, Father. Forgive me for the things that I have done. And as we make that that covenant with God, we are expected to live the rest of our lives differently in gratitude for what God has done for us. I mean, this is like, this goes with the territory. And yet, how many people, let's think about this, somewhere down the line, a couple years later, become discontent with their Christian lives. 
begin to feel unsatisfied with what God has done for them or how much God has blessed them with, and they begin to look out at the ungodly things of this world, thinking the grass is greener, and they begin to turn their branches toward the things of the world. And that's exactly the story because that's exactly what they had done. And they had done this after everything that God had done for them. Would you agree with me that at this time God had done more for them than any other people on planet Earth? And still they did this. This was their ungratefulness. This was again their their pride that caused them to think that they deserved more or better than what God had given them. And the lesson, of course, in the riddle was, is God supposed to be okay with that? Are there not supposed to be consequences for you turning your back on the one who has done everything for you? Because as we know, if Nebuchadnezzar, right, was going to judge Zedekiah for doing that after all that he had done for him, oh, God had done so much more for us. And the consequences, again, are going to be the same. Now, what's so sad about this, and again, you know, we're going to cover more, but you, we know the rest of the story. Not only did Zedekiah reap the consequences of his sin, because no one gets away with sin, amen? We all reap what we sow. That's just part of it. God sees everything, even in the dark, and he knows what we have done. And so we're all going to pay the consequences of our sin. That's that's a given. But the saddest part, here's the saddest part, is that in his foolishness, Zedekiah turned to Egypt. He turned to Pharaoh because he thought that Pharaoh would be able to offer him something more than he had. And he never did. How many of you would agree that sin never satisfies? Oh, we think it might, right? We think that Satan has something better to offer us than what God has, has in store for us. And that's why we sin. But how foolish, because sin never satisfies. And in the end, we simply end up reaping the consequences of our foolishness. Verse 16. As I live, declares the Lord God, surely in the place where the king dwells, who made him king, Babylon, whose oath he despised and whose covenant with him he broke, in Babylon he shall die. The wages of sin is death, we know that. Verse 17, Pharaoh with his mighty army and great company will not help him in war when mounds are cast up and siege walls are built to cut off many lives. He despised the oath in breaking the covenant and behold, he gave his hand and did all these things. He shall not escape. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, as I live, surely it is my oath that he despised and my covenant that he broke. I will return it upon his head. I will spread my net over him and he shall be taken in my snare and I will bring him to Babylon and enter into judgment with him. Therefore, the treachery he has committed against me. This is God speaking. And all the pick of his troops shall fall by the sword and the survivors shall be scattered to every wind and you shall know that I am the Lord, I have spoken. These were the consequences. These were the consequences. Again, God makes it clear, these were the consequences which are death for the sin, for the rebellion, and not only betraying Nebuchadnezzar, but also in violating the covenant that he swore in the name of the Lord. That he swore in the name of the Lord. Zedekiah trusted in Egypt, but God made it clear. Egypt was never going to help you. The world will never be there for you. So that when it all happened, again, when word got back to Nebuchadnezzar that what Zedekiah had done, Nebuchadnezzar returns, and if you want to look it up later, 2 Kings 25, Jeremiah 52, Zedekiah is captured as he's trying to flee the cities. His army, his bodyguards are wiped out. He is taken uh, to the border outside the city, and it is there that his eyes are gouged out. Do you guys remember the story? 
But before Nebuchadnezzar had Zedekiah's eyes gouged out, he slaughtered all his sons with the sword. So that that would be the last thing that he saw. These are the consequences of sin, right? These are the consequences. Now again, as I read this and, and just consider the story, would it be fair to say that God expects us to keep our word? Let me say that again. Would it be fair to say that God expects us to keep our word? You know he does, right? God calls all of us to be men and women of integrity. Not unfaithful people, not disloyal people. And that's why we have to be careful. We have to make sure that our yeses are yeses and our noes are noes. And it's the same lesson that Solomon, you might remember, that he wrote in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 4. When you make a vow to God, when you make a promise to God, do not delay to fulfill it. God has no pleasure in fools. Fulfill your vow. It is better not to make a vow than to make one and not fulfill it. Don't make God promises you don't intend to keep. Do not let your mouth lead you into sin and do not protest to the temple messenger, my vow was a mistake. I was just kidding. I didn't mean it. Why should God be angry at what you say and destroy the work of your hands? God is going to hold us accountable. After all that God has done for us, after all the things that we have uttered with our mouth, if we said, God, I receive you as my Lord and Savior, the word Lord means master. That means we have willingly submitted ourselves to his rule, to his lead, and God expects us to live the rest of our lives that way. And if instead we say, uh, I know I said that 10 years ago, but I don't mean it anymore. Well, then we have gone back on our word. Then we have broken our promise or a commitment we made to God, and we will face the consequences for our action. Now, what's so interesting about this, again, as I really thought about this and, and uh, I really enjoyed the chapter, I just mentioned that God has done so much for Israel more than any other people in the world. And I think we would all agree with that. But who would you say God has done the second most for? America. Would you say America? I would say America. Think about all that God has done for America. Think about how much God has blessed America. Again, this is my opinion, but I believe this. That God has, from the very beginning, established this nation that was based on Judeo-Christian beliefs. And from the very beginning, God's blessing was upon this nation. Did we make mistakes? Sure, every nation does. But to this day, this is the beacon where people from all over the world wanna come and live because of God's blessing upon the nation. But here's the sad thing. Have we turned our back on God? Have we been unfaithful? Have we been disloyal to the one that blessed us? Kicking him out of our courts, kicking him out of our schools, right? Kicking him out of this country. And for this reason, I think we've lost that blessing. And we look out at the world, we look at this country that's trillions of dollars in debt and everything that's going on in tragedy after, after catastrophe taking place. And it looks like this country is headed downhill. Is it no surprise that we have begun to reap the consequences of betraying the one who has done so much for us? Now, I think about that, and I think that's, that's kind of heavy. Now, think about something. In 586 BC, a few years after what we're reading, as I mentioned, Nebuchadnezzar returns to Jerusalem, right? Surrounds the city and wipes out everybody, leaving a few survivors which they take back to, to Babylon. Now here's what always gets me, and this is, this is so sad, but I want you to think about this. How many of you believe that within that ungodly city, as we know they were ungodly, there had to have been a few righteous people? Right? I have to believe that. But they suffered just like everybody else, didn't they? Now think about this. Let us sink down deep inside. The righteous suffered because of the failure of their 
nation. And I think about that. I believe things are going to continue to get worse in this country. I really do. And I wonder how much even Christians, even genuine Christians, are going to suffer because we're living in an ungodly nation. Now to me, what does that say? What should that say to you? What should that say to me? It should say that with everything that we are and with every voice that we can utter, we should be standing for righteousness. We should be doing everything we can, praying for this nation, right? Being that example, being that light, doing everything, again, humanly possible as we rely on God's spirit, no doubt about it, to do everything we can to slow down, if I can use that word, the judgment, the ultimate judgment of God that's coming. Does that make sense? But you know what's so sad? How many Christians are doing nothing? How many Christians are just going with the flow? How many Christians are just embracing what is happening or what is going to happen? And I love this because again, you know, I believe that God is calling us to stand. I believe God is calling us to speak up. And one of the ways that we have an opportunity to speak up is in two weeks, by getting out there and voting. This is our thankful, our, our, our right as citizens, right, of this great country to take a stand, to vote for what's right, and not allow, again, things to continue the way they're going right now. And I want to challenge you. One of the things I'm going to say, and again, it's up to you, but I'm going to be out there voting on November 5th. And on Wednesday, I'm going to come with my sticker. And I want to see how many stickers we'll have in this room. And so I challenge you to do your part, to do everything you can to stand for what's right, right? Specifically, the most important issue on our ballot is abortion and being pro-life and standing for those that cannot defend themselves. It's the most important issue, more than money, more than the economy, more than everything else, right? Standing for the unborn. And so I challenge you to make sure you vote, again, the way that I believe God would call every Christian to vote, to take a stand, to do what God has called us to do and not sit doing nothing on the sidelines. Amen? Amen. All right, last thing. Last thing, we're done. We covered the riddle, the explanation. How about the promise? Let's cover the promise in our last couple verses. Verse 22. Thus says the Lord God, I myself will take a sprig from the lofty top of the cedar tree and will set it out. I will break off from the topmost of its young twigs a tender one. And I myself will plant it on a high and lofty mountain. On the mountain height of Israel will I plant it that it may bear branches and produce fruit and become a noble cedar. Now, I love this because what's God doing? Well, God has just used Ezekiel to give the riddle, and God continues the riddle. And God takes the place of the eagle, and he says, I'm going to do something, okay? I will, notice the will, I will do something. I'm going to go to the cedar tree. What does the cedar tree represent? It, re it represents the throne of Israel, right? The line of King David. That's where the king was. That's where Jehoiachin was on top. God says, I'm going to go to that cedar tree. I'm going to take from that cedar tree a top branch. And I am going to plant that branch, a tender one, on a high and lofty mountain, on the mountain height of Israel, we will call that today Mount Zion. And there I will plant it, that it may bear branches and produce fruit and become a noble cedar. What are we reading here? We are reading here, right, 600 years or so before the birth of Christ, that God will keep his promise that he made to King David. And from the line of King David, God will take a branch, a tender one, and place him in, on Mount Zion, right on the mountain of Israel, and there, this one, this tender one, will produce fruit. 
this tender one, why, will bear branches. Now this is so beautiful because God, again, is describing the Messiah that was to come. The Messiah, again, that will bear many branches. You guys might remember John 15. He's the vine, we are the branches. And produce fruit. Now, this is a fulfillment of what we've already read before, what had already been uttered by Isaiah, Isaiah 11.1, 1, there shall come forth a shoot, a branch from the stump of Jesse, who's Jesse? King David's dad. And a branch from its roots shall bear fruit. Isaiah had already declared this. Jeremiah had already declared. Jeremiah 23.5, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David's righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, in the days that he reigns, Judah will be saved. Interesting. Israel will be saved. And Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called the Lord is our righteousness. Which brings us to the last verses. Keep reading. And under it, under this uh, This new cedar tree will dwell every kind of bird. In the shade of its branches, birds of every sort will nest. And all the trees of the field shall know that I am the Lord. I will bring low the high tree and make high the low tree. Dry up the green tree and make the dry tree flourish. I am the Lord and I have spoken and I will do it. Now what's so beautiful as we read this as I'm done tonight We know that God raised up Jesus the Messiah from the line of David. We see the genealogy, right, in Matthew and in Luke. Jesus coming from the line of David on both Joseph and Mary's side. Always remember that. In fulfillment of this prophecy. But we also read here of his return. His second coming. When he returns and will rule and reign on the throne of Israel in what the book of Revelation refers to as the millennial reign of Christ. When that happens, people from every tribe and every tongue and every nation are going to serve him. Like birds under the the tree, that tree providing shade and shelter and protection for all who are his. And in that day, as we've read many times before, It will be then that Israel will come back to God. It will be then that Israel will be saved. Now the beauty in all of this and the reason that this is here is because despite the fact that Israel had been disloyal and unfaithful to keep their word, God remains faithful. God is the one who made a promise and God will keep his word and that's exactly how he ends. Look back. I am the Lord. I have spoken and I will do it. You've heard me say many times before, God is faithful to his word. His word never changes because God never changes. And because we expect God to keep his word, God expects us to keep ours. May we be keepers of our word, men and women of integrity. Amen? We'll pick it up next week. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you, Lord, tonight for your word. Thank you, Lord, for an incredible parable, an incredible riddle. Thank you, Lord, for the lesson that we find, Lord. I love so much studying your word and reading your word and and understanding what's important to you. And I think the lesson tonight, Lord, is you expect us to be grateful. You expect us to be so thankful for all that you have done for us, Lord God, that we would remain loyal to you. That if we've made promises to you, Lord, we would would keep those promises. That we would truly be men and women of integrity. That we would be like our Father who keeps his word. Lord, we thank you for your goodness. Lord, we thank you that you are a merciful and forgiving God. And I pray, Lord, help us, Lord. We've all failed you. We've all failed But the main thing is to learn from our mistakes, to learn from our failures that we would not repeat them. We thank you. We love you. As always, we're careful to give you the glory you alone deserve. In Jesus' name we pray.